Hello, this is Mark Uncafer, and welcome to the Fiber Optic Sensing Association webinar, uh, Optical Cable Selection for Pipeline Sensing Applications. Uh, this is with the Prismian Group, and we're very pleased to have as our presenter today, uh, Paul Baird, who has 31 years of engineering and commercial experience in the optical fiber and cable industry, and is currently Prismian's Industrial Optical Cable Product Manager. Um, this is a great way to learn more about how uh, uh, op how fiber optic sensing can uh, provide safety in uh, the pipeline environment. Paul, we look forward to hearing your uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear uh, as I remark and, and share this. Again, the name is Paul Baird. I'm with Prismium Group, and we're here to talk about optical cable selection for pipeline sensing applications. And uh, we're going to first talk a little bit about petroleum pipelines and the transport hazards associated with those. Then we'll review some sensing technologies that can be laid alongside the pipeline. Uh, and then we'll cover the cable designs that are, that are available for those applications. And then we'll match the cable designs to the various sensing technologies that are out there. And of course, We'll wrap it up with a short discussion on adding some additional fibers for potential communication systems along, used along the pipeline. So in 1865, Samuel Van Sickle was the first person who organized or built a pipeline. And uh, it was built out of wrought iron pipe, carried 2,400 barrels per day capacity. And he charged a, barrel per, a dollar per barrel to transport that oil. Today, pipelines account for 70% of all the petroleum product transported in the, in the USA, and pipelines account for 90% of the petroleum products transported in Canada. A couple of definitions. Today, they charge about $5 per barrel to transport oil in these pipelines, and by definition, the pipe, a barrel is equivalent to 42 gallons. Now, when we look at the universal application of pipelines, we see that the first, that the refinery itself is at the center of the, uh, of the pipeline. And uh, everything upstream to the pipeline is where the oil is produced. It's extracted from the ground under the sea or transported from offshore locations. Uh, it all makes its way into, the pi into a pipe that makes its way into a refinery. And then from the refinery, the distilled products make their way to the various consumers, including uh, heating oil, gasoline, and, and uh, jet fuel as examples of the, of the distillate project products that are transferred downstream from the refinery. Now you can see from this chart that there's a, an extensive a network of pipelines that exist in the United States. And in fact, uh, as of 2014, there were 160,000 miles of pipeline the average annual investment for this is about 2% growth rate, which equates to about two to 3,000 miles per year on average. The key point of this is that every new pipe that's installed could use an optical sensor to go, will, uh, to go along with it. If we were, and so the next point I wanna raise is that natural gas is another hydrocarbon that uses almost exclusive pi pipeline distribution for uh, transport and distribution. And in fact, there are 10 times the amount of natural gas lines as there are petroleum pipelines. Now, about 19% of the transmission pipelines, or 19% of the, of the total pipelines are transmission lines, and the other 80% are distribution lines, including uh, the line that may go to your house if you are a natural, gra natural gas consumer. The growth rate for natural gas installations is, is right around 1% or less, but that's because the install base is so high. That still amounts to close to 10,000 miles of pipe being added every year. And if you just take 20% of that, then for the transmission lines, then that's just, uh, that's 2,000 miles a year for transmission line. And again, the same comment is that every one of these pipes could use an optical sensor. So what I'm highlighting is that the opportunity for doing, doing uh, pipeline sensing uh, is quite significant. Now, but there are some hazards with transporting petroleum. And you can see from the photos here that petroleum really is transferred 
uh, with rail or truck or uh, via pipeline, and there are various hazards possible with that. In fact, Forbes did a did a report a few years ago where they where they analyzed the information available and from a uh, from a human tragedy perspective, uh, trucking is the most dangerous form of transportation for oil, and that really is indicative of the total number of people involved in transporting primarily gasoline and he heating fuel at the distribution level. But when you add to, when you look at it in the scale of the volume that's spilled, uh, trucking again is the, is the highest uh, area that causes the amount of, that loses the amount of total spillage. But when you look at environmental impact, uh, pipelines jump to the top. Now we say, why is that? If trucking spills the most volume, why does pipeline volume have the most environmental impact. And the, the key distinction to that is, is that whenever there is a truck accident, uh, the location of that accident is well understood quite quickly. And there are trained professionals who can respond quickly uh, to mitigate any environmental damage associated with uh, that, that spill that occurred from that truck accident. Whereas with a pipeline, the accident may occur in very remote areas, and it may take some time before the leak is identified and uh, mitigation activities can take place. For example, in uh, these are I've listed two uh, accidents that have occurred have occurred in recently. The first one occurred just last month. The Keystone pipeline spilled 210,000 gallons of crude oil in South Dakota. And uh, in that accident, the uh, when you, if, when you read the uh, media reports on this, the the uh, Trans Canada Pipeline Company would say that they that they shut down the pipe and within minutes after identifying that the a leak was occurring. What they don't say is how long it took them to actually identify a leak using their uh, conventional mass transfer uh, calculations. And they also don't indicate how long it took them to, once they determined that a leak was occurring, they don't say how long it took them to actually identify the location of that leak. So those are two things that uh, are there. And when you talk to the, when we, you read the media reports on the Colonial Pipeline accident that occurred in, the, in Alabama last year, uh, this leak was discovered actually by a, a member of the Alabama Mining Inspection Organization. He was out inspecting abandoned coal mines as a routine inspection when he could smell the gasoline. So he wandered through the woods till he came upon an old abandoned mining tailings pond that was actually filled with gasoline. That's when he notified authorities who then notified the pipeline operator colonial and they then shut down the pipe and began remedi remediation all of which spilled 336,000 gallons of gasoline so in each one of these instances what you what you get in the media reports you get the uh, the actual event and the location of the event you get the amount of of uh, material that is spilled but what always follows on in those same articles is an assessment of the environmental impact and they bring in various experts and so forth to give their to give their assessment of the uh, of the event so we call this as we look at the total risk of an accident we look at we may look to the folks over at freak freakonomics to help us identify what the total risk of an accident really is first there's the hazard or the actual event the cost associated with that the risk that an event may occur plus all of the outrage that's associated with that event. That's, that's the really the total risk that you have to mitigate. And in each one of these cases, of course, both, both say the actual event and the quote outrage that's occurred with that event is very prominent. So with dis distributed optical sensing, you can uh, work to mitigate both the hazard risk as well as the outrage risk. And how do we do that? Well, when you deploy a distributed fiber sensing system on a pipeline, you get the advantage of real-time continuous monitoring. You can uh, monitor the entire pipeline along its length. You receive early warning when there is when a leak or other event is occurring, and you can ad clearly identify where that event location is, and it, that enables very rapid response. 
what that enables you to do is mitigate is rapidly mitigate the total total event and the, associated with this or the disaster associated with this event but then when you also deploy distributed fiber optic extension you can reduce the outrage associated with this by communicating the benefits of optical sensing to all of the various stakeholders uh, we can continue to promote investments in distributed fiber sensing for these applications and as a per personal plug for the fiber optic sensing association everyone who on the call should join and be part of the lobbying effort that's going on uh, to encourage the deployment of distributed fiber sensing in, in a wide variety of applications. So we'll next look a little bit at the causes of uh, pipeline accidents. And the area that's shaded in blue in this pie are all those items that are directly affected by, by distributed pipeline sensing. In other words, if there's a if there's a cor corrosion event or material material failure, or someone conducting unauthorized excavation on the pipe or other kind of natural or other da forces that cause damage, all of that can be monitored with a fiber sensing system. What's interesting is that I'm not fully conversant on exactly what the equipment failure, incorrect operation categories entail. And even some of those events are likely mitigated with, or helped with uh, using optical sensing. So greater than 63% of all the pipeline accidents could be uh, minimized using uh, optical sensing technology. So let's do a quick overview of what the sec sensing technologies are. And doing so, I borrow some slides from the Fiber Optic Sensing Association. This is These are generated by the Technical Committee of of which I am also a member. <clears throat> and we've created these slides for use uh, for, for member companies to educate uh, participants or anyone on the use of fiber optic sensing. So what is a fiber optic sensing system? It's a, it's a technology that connects a, a query device to the optical fiber cable and where the fiber itself is the sensor and uh, the the optical cable is installed entirely along the assets that's being monitored, such in this case we're discussing pipelines, but we can talk broadly about optical sensing with regard to power lines, railways, roads, or other critical facilities. And uh, then that system then monitors the, um, the asset that's being monitored. In this case, you use the cable as the sensor, and you can detect and classify the various events, such as this this diagram showing showing any kind of third party intrusion uh, on that might cause damage to the pipe. You can monitor for leak detection for leaks. You can also monitor for ground movement or or deformation that may occur as a result of ground movement. So that's what fiber sensing can do for you. So how does it work? Well, the key thing is to think about is that the the fiber, the, the sensing system relies upon the interaction of the light that's being transmitted in the optical fiber itself. When a light travels through the optical fiber, the main pulse of that light travels forward through the glass, but a small portion of that light is actually back scattered or back reflected almost. It is like a mirror in the sense that some of that, ref, that light that's going forward is actually being reflected back. And there are three physical phenomenon that that engage with this uh, backscatter. There's the Raman uh, backscatter, the Rayleigh backscatter, and the Brillouin backscatter. And each one of these type of backscatter characteristics can be monitored uh, to understand the external forces that may be engaging on the on the optical fiber itself, such as strain, temperature, or acoustics. And so what the sensing technology, what the sensing does is that once you receive that information, then you can act upon that information in the, uh, every, for every bit of along the fiber as you go. So what are the key benefits? We kind of summarized this previously, but the first benefit is that it overcomes the limitations of point sensors. It uh, enables real-time operation with a high degree of act accuracy and you can work this 
work the system or the system operates for long periods of time with very low maintenance. The other key advantage is that you can use extra fibers in the cable for data communications for the pipeline operator, or if you choose or are able to offer fiber services to other carriers, you can lease the capacity uh, of those fibers that are used along that right of way. So there are several key advantages of optical fiber. Now what you need to do then is look at, uh, well, what are the appropriate cable designs that, that should be laid alongside of a pipe? And what I'm here to, to talk about now are just some of the basic cable designs and uh, standards that go with those designs and the various applications wherein they're used. So the first, the first I will talk about um, the optical fiber type itself. The most common optical fiber used in sensing systems is single mode fiber. <laughs> and that's because the light propagation and reflection characteristics are highly sensitive to the external environment. But it's important to note that, the, that the, the, both the design and production processes of the single mode fiber are, are important to understand because they, they do influence the sensing capabilities of the, of the system. Because they, and then the second fiber type that's, that's used less commonly but is still used in some applications is multimode optical fiber. And I've listed the four, the four key multimode fiber types that are available there but the key point of this slide is and this is the only slide i direct directly to fiber technology is that when you select a a sensing system we would recommend that you discuss the fiber types directly with your equipment vendor the sensing or interrogator vendor and and work out the details on selecting the exact fiber type that's been qualified for their sensing system so with that we'll move into uh some of the discussion on the cable design. And we'll first talk about loose tube cable. This is the primary workhorse of the communications industry and throughout the world. Loose tube cable has been deployed for widely for many years and really is the uh, a viable candidate for the sensing applications. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you begin to build a loose tube cable, you begin with multiple colored fibers. It's common to put 12 fibers inside of a buffer tube, which we, when we, we will extrude a, a buffer tube over these 12 fibers. And you can have inside of that buffer tube some water blocking co compound, which is either a gel material or a dry material that's water swellable when it comes back into contact with water. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But then you take a central member and you take multiple of these tubes and strand them around this central member and you add, you go ahead and add some water swellable materials in the core of the cable, a rip cord, and add some addition, some water swellable materials around the outside of the core, and some strength members to give the cable its tensile strength, and you and you essentially have a um, an optical cable core for a loose tube cable. Now, before going further, I'd like to bring up a concept known as uh, fiber strain. And to do that, we would like to define what fiber, what strain is in, in direct, directly. So strain is a reversible elongation under tension. And what you get is when you stretch an item uh, under tension, then when you release that tension, it comes back to its original uh, length. And that's, the, that's uh, the type of strain that we're defining here and talking about with regard to fiber strain. So when you apply that to that concept to an optical cable, what you have is when you pull on the cable, the cable itself will begin to elongate and experience strain. But with a loose tube cable, you can have the point where you where you can pull on the where there's a certain point where you pull on the cable to the point where the fiber itself begins to experience strain. And that difference between when the cable experiences strain and when the fiber begins to experience strain is known as the strain-free window. And uh, so this is a very important uh, aspect of loose tube cable when talking about sensing systems. But the key point of the strain-free window is that the fiber can remain strain-free even when the cable is under tension. And so what are the key benefits of loose tube cables? Well, the attributes, those are the that you have an excess fiber length inside of the tube. This enables the, 
the fiber to move freely with inside the tube, and that's what creates and allows for the strain-free window. The benefits of this is that it provides for consistent attenuation in all weather conditions. It isolates the fiber from external, com external forces such as tensile, compression, etc. And um, during the actual act of installing the cable, the fiber doesn't experience any of the installation forces. And so you get a zero, the, the fiber is under zero fiber strain in a relaxed state. What this means is that loose tube fibers isolate the, I, are isolated from any cable strain. Now I'll get to add a little bit more description as to the, as to the sheath options. The, a very common option is to apply a single polyethylene jacket over the outside of the cable core. And that's this single jacket cable is primarily used inside of conduits. Then you could build, add a second uh, layer of, of polyethylene or other polymer material to give you a double jacket cable. And that one is also play, placed in conduit, but this one can also be direct buried in certain applications that we'll talk about. And then the third opportunity or design for a sheath is when you add steel tape armor. Now this particular gra graphic shows a double jacket cable with a steel tape inner layer between the two jackets and you can have a configuration where you put the steel tape over the strength elements of the core of the cable and just apply a single jacket over the top of that both are very common uh, these are the most common direct buried cables but sometimes uh, they are also installed into conduits so the second type of cable that's used in sensing applications is really a tight buffer cable and for building it, for making a tight buffer cable, we would reference the be begin with the 250 micron coated fiber. That then is, uh, we add an additional thermoplastic layer to bring that out to 900 microns. And then if we're building an interconnect cable, we would add a, some airmed yarn and some additional jacketing material to create what, what we, what is traditionally known as an interconnect cable. This, the, mil, the diameter of this cable shown here is two and a half millimeters. It could be anywhere from, from one and a half millimeters up to three millimeters as most common sizes. What you do then with these, when you build a tight buffer cable construction, an actual, an actual cable, you can begin with taking these 900 micron units and combining them together under one jacket with some airborne yards to create what's called a tight buffer distribution cable. And then secondly, you can take multiple of these subunits that the simplex subunits that I described previously and strand them together and create what's called a tight buffer breakout style cable. The key point about uh, there are the attributes and benefits of the of the of the uh, tight buffer cable is that the fibers are tightly covered to the tightly coupled to the buffering and cable materials. And the fiber is not isolated from the external forces such as tensile and compression. And so there is an immediate fiber strain that occurs during tension. Now the key advantage in, for tight buffer cables in the telecom environment is that they are easily connectorized. But the key point with relate, relating to sensing is that any tension on this type of cable will produce immediate fiber strain. So what I've, uh, in covering those two cable types, what I'm going, what I will do introduce to you now are the, the is this cable that will continue to grow as we talked about more cable types and configurations. But the key attribute that we've identified so far between these two cables is that loose tube cable has very low strain coupling. It's and whereas the tight buffer cable has very high strain strain coupling. So the loose tube cable is isolated strain and the tight buffer is not. Now I'm going to divert a little bit to uh, optical cable standards as we get into this. Now here you can see uh, what we're saying with this is that optical cables can and should be designed to withstand the rigorous handling and ins installation conditions. And this is an example of a cable that's being directly plowed into the ground. The cable reel itself is, is on the front of this cable plow. The cable passes over the top of the plow and down, down toward the blade. And then the blade itself is slicing the earth and the cable is laying down inside that, that, that 
simple trench. The example here is that, this, is that optical cables are very rugged and you can design cables to be re very rugged for, for pipeline installation applications. And the primary standard associated with this type of outside plant cable is the what we in short term call the ICEA 640. It's the standard for optical cable outside plant cables. Now, because some people refer to and desire to use tight buffer cables, most tight buffer cables are specified under the standard of ICA 696, which is for these indoor outdoor optical cables. But both of these designs our, our standards are applicable to cables that, can, that are designed for use that can be used for for pipeline sensing applications. So here in this chart, I've summarized uh, kind of some comparisons between ICEA 640 and ICEA 696. And you can see where things like the compressive load is more intense and the ten installation tensile strength is more intense for the ICEA 640 versus the ICEA 696. But the other key point I'm making here is that these standards are very comprehensive. They cover all of the various aspects of cable and cable deployment that would um, that impact what w when we use cables in sensing applications. So the ICEA specifications are very, are very comprehensive and loose tube cables in general are more robust than tight buffer cables are. So when we place optical cables in a uh, along a pipe, we can direct bury the, we can directly bury the cable alongside the pipe in the trench, either in the bottom of the trench for petroleum products or on top of the pipe for natural gas. Uh, if you're doing temperature sensing for those, that's where you would place that. And then you can also place a conduit beside the pipe and then come back later and put a, uh, an optical fiber into the conduit using uh, either pull, pulling or blowing the, the uh, cable into the, into the pipe. So, but one of the things when you're installing an optical cable in the ground, you have to pay attention to this little guy. All throughout North America, we have these little, we have these little golfers that can cause significant damage to optical cables. And what we really say is that a single jacket, all dielectric cable does not have any rodent protection. The primary purpose of steel tape armoring is to provide rodent protection. But one of the key disadvantages of steel tape armoring is that it requires grounding along the, along the cable route. So one way to avoid having to do grounding is to lay a conduit and then put the, uh, the all dielectric single jacket cable inside of the conduit and the conduit will provide rodent protection and then you don't have to have the the uh, you don't have any metallic elements so grounding of that of that is not required so and in some instances uh, we do see pipeline operators who will bury a dual jacket cable uh, and we say that this is okay, but you have to pay attention to the fact that it's only resistant for very small rodents. It would not stop a, bit, a golfer from chewing through a cable, but it, it may stop some other small, less aggressive rodents. So you see these are the three types of cables that are generally laid beside the pipe. Now, let's add that, add back to the table I started with and add some of the features that we've now brought up first. We've introduced the concept of armoring and dielectric cables or, or dual jacketed cables and uh, single jacket cables inside of conduits. And then we've also added the fact that these cables have standards and uh, they're either highly robust or not quite so robust. And then we've added which elements ha have rodent protection and which don't have rodent protection. So you can as we build this table, you'll be able to see as we go along. The key point of this is that loose tube cables are very robust and the armored cables provide great rodent protection and a, and a cable in conduit will provide great rodent protection. So now we get to move on and talk about matching these cable designs to the sensing technologies themselves. So let's first talk about distributed temperature sensing. First, in this case, the fiber senses the temperature that changes when that 
a temperature change that occurs when at the leak location. Now what's required is that for DTS systems, you need to have excellent thermal coupling and you have to have strain-free optical fibers. So let's talk first about thermal coupling. And when you deal with a direct buried, buried cable, the whatever temperature change the ground is experiencing, that temperature change will pass through that energy transfer or heat transfer will, will transfer into the cable to the optical fiber itself where the fiber will sense that temperature change and notify and give an alarm to the, to the sensing interrogator something is going on. When you put a cable inside of a conduit, this works, but the air inside of the conduit acts as, a, uh, as an insulating material. So what we're saying is that while a distributed temperature sensing system works with the cabling conduit, the time for recognizing an event is, is uh, increased just because of the air acting as an insulation uh, around that cable. Now, the same concept holds true for uh, gel-free versus gel-filled buffer tubes. The gel-filled buffer tube provides excellent fiber protection and water blocking, and the dry water block material inside the, inside the buffer tube provides this, the same swellable material, and it, and it eliminates the need for cleanup after, of the gel when you're, when you're working with the fibers. That's the key advantage. But the, the point we're making in terms of sensing is that a gel-filled buffer tube will have improved thermal coupling relative to the performance of a gel-free. We're not saying you don't use a gel-free. What we're just doing is highlighting some the, that there are differences between the performances of each type. So when we now look at this same table with regard to uh, distributor temperature sensing, and we look at thermal comp coupling, you can see that the gel-filled cables uh, have good thermal coupling. The cabling conduit um, may be a little bit less so. And then but, and the strain coupling required for temperature sensing is, is there. So a loose tube cable is ideal for DTS. Gel-free is acceptable. Cable and conduit is acceptable. And the advantage of using the loose tube cable for this is that you can use the ICA 640 specifications to, to, uh, to uh, specify this cable for performance. So now we move along to uh, just talking about distributed strain sensing, and this is where the cable itself experiences a pulling tension. And as the cable experiences strain, then the, the fiber will lengthen when it experiences strain. And at very low levels, this strain is not harmful to the fiber, but, it, but helpful for, for identifying strain that may be occurring. So what do we use fiber and fiber strain sensing for? Pretty much to, a, to sense ground movement that comes from erosion, landslides, earthquakes, or other, other types of activities. And distributed strain sensing cables, they should have some, the fiber itself should have some slight strain inside the cable. And they need to have excellent coupling between the fiber and the cable components. So what we're really saying is that for distributed strain sensing, a tight buffer cable is, real, is the ideal cable for this application. So what you see is the, almost the complete opposite of what we talked about for distributed temperature sensing, in that when you talk about static strain sensing, the tight buffer cable is the ideal uh, cable for use, and loose tube cable, less so. So you would reference in specifying a tight buffer distribution cable, you would reference ICEA 696, uh, but the single jacket version has minimal rodent protection. And the challenge also is that using cable in conduit minimizes the effect of strain because that the conduit itself would begin to sense the strain long before that could be passed on to the cable inside. So then you look at, okay, what about the cable that's used for distributed acoustic sensing? And in that case, uh, what we refer to as that acoustic sensing is really the fiber itself sensing the sound waves and changes in sound waves in its environment. And so the animals, people, machines, et cetera, that are operating in or around this optical fiber generate sound. 
and the optical cable will pick up the these sound waves and the fiber backscatter characteristics change with regard to the sound waves that come in contact with. So what are the key operating requirements for an, a distributed acoustic sensing system? Is that you need effective transfer of the acoustic en energy so that you can have maximum sensitivity. But you also need to make sure that there's minimal dis distortion of that signal as it passes through so you can have maximum selectivity of the, what the, of who or what is generating that sound signal. So fiber strain is also an important benefit in sensing in these distributed acoustic sensing systems. So you want to have a uh, as minim basically minimize the insulating materials as well. So what we're really saying is that acoustic sensing relies on the dynamic fiber strain, which is at the molecular level rather than at the at the static level. So when we look at this particular the chart, and I've added the third column here, which is in the blue for dynamic strain coupling, we will see in the end use, we'll see gel filled loose tube cables used for distributed acoustic sensing systems. And, uh, but the, the all dielectric version does a little bit better than the armored version. And uh, cable and conduit work also works okay. And, but because of its strain characteristics, a tight buffer cable would works great as well. So these are the kind of matching the cable types to the, uh, to the uh, strain or rather to the sensing system. So I summarized already what the uh, what we would do, but I would encourage you if you're doing a DAS system to talk directly with your sensing system provider with regard to cable and conduit and armored cables for using a DAS system. So then we get into a discussion. Well, what if we desire to do multiple sensing systems and how do we over how is it possible to overcome the dichotomy between using strain sensitive sensitive fibers versus strain isolated fibers in the same configuration. And what we get into is we say, well, let's look at deploying multiple interrogators. Sometimes these multiple interrogators are in the same system, and other times they may be different boxes that, can, that contain the sensing technology. But you would do, perhaps in this example, you would do temperature sensing for leaks, you might do strain sensing for ground movement, and you might do acoustic sensing for intrusions, as an example. A very common application is, what's, is what is combined, the di distributed temperature sensing and strain sensing together. And in this operation, what you need is, a, is strain isolated fibers for the temperature sensing, but strain coupled fibers for the, for the strain sensing. And in, in a distributed acoustic system, if you're going to add this to these, you would you could choose either the tight buffer fibers or the gel filled loose tube cables. And I I didn't mention before, but it was in, in the note there is that gel free cables you should not use with distributed acoustic sensing. When that that air around the fibers really muffles the sound transfer, uh sound wave transfer to the fibers itself. So don't use gel-free cables when doing acoustic sensing. But what 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 is possible is to look at uh, hybrid cables that uh, combine some of these elements into one cable, so that you can overcome some of these differences between the fiber requirements for the different uh, sensing systems. In this in this hybrid cable example. What we have is we have loose tube fibers for strain isolated temperature sensing. And then we have simplex type buffer units for coupled strain sensing and for coupled acoustic sensing. And uh, also then you could have this cable come in the various sheath options for direct buried applications, conduit applications, or, or armored steel tape armored cables for uh, environment or for rodent protection that you might need. So when you look at a hybrid cable, and then you apply these different, you look at it as compared to all of these, you see all of the red boxes have gone away. Basically, we, we're, we're saying is that with, with the, this hybrid type configuration, you can do uh, temperature sensing, you can do strain sensing, and you can do acoustic sensing pretty much with the same 
cable using each fiber for its own characteristic. The advantage of this, of this type of cable is that as the core resembles that of a loose tube cable, it's fully compliant to ICEA 640, making it the most robust uh, cable that you could use along pipelines. So the last thing I said I would talk about in our in this discussion would was to talk about uh, adding communications fibers and what you can do with this hybrid cable design that I've that we've talked about is that you can have the sensing fibers that that have that use both the strain isolated fibers or the strain coupled fibers for the sensing systems and then you could add any number of additional buffer tubes containing communications fibers so that you would have a full a cable that offers a full range of opportunities when you look at the economics of these pipeline installations when we look when when you look strictly at the cable adding an additional 12 fibers a 12 fiber buffer tube to a cable that might add as much as 15 percent to the total cable cost but the cable itself is less than 5% of the total pipeline in installation project. So adding an incremental 12 fibers for whatever communication purposes you might desire is only, is really less than 1% of the total project cost when you do that. So what we're saying is that the extra fiber when you choose to add that enables the pipeline operator to have and maintain internal communications networks along the pipeline so essentially, they're communicating with themselves and, and with all, all the transferring the data and voice, whatever they would need, alongside of those fibers that are physically doing the sensing function. And then if they have permission on the right-of-way to actually sell additional services for, for that right-of-way, then they can lease the dark fiber or sell the broadband services that might be available. So that, in essence, concludes uh, the, the presentation, and I'll somewhat summarize then what we've covered, is that pipelines are an integral part of our ener energy infrastructure, and they're not going away. They're critical for the economics of our, of our uh, economy. But distributed fiber sensing can mitigate the, the impact of, these, of any hazardous pipeline event, and that existing optical cable standards to define robust cables that are essential for sensing applications. You don't have to look elsewhere beyond the currently defined standards to identify cables for pipeline sensing applications. In general, loose tube cables are more robust than pipe buffer cables. The armored cables and cable and duct provide rodent protection for those areas of the, of the North America where we have in rodent infestation that could damage cables. That loose tube cables are strain free and therefore ideal for distributed temperature sensing. That strain coupled pipe buffer cables are I ideal for strain sensing and acoustic sensing so that you can think about using a hybrid version of these where you incorporate the advantages of both into a cable where you can where you could really do all types as needed for uh for sensing for your sensing system along the route so that's the uh, end of my discussion and if anyone has any questions please raise them sure thank you very much paul to uh just mark Ankefer again with fosa uh to raise a question uh there's a box on the right hand of the screen where you can uh, uh, type in uh, your question and we'll be happy to kind of take through some of them. Uh, one of the issues that I've just wanted to kind of raise taking the prerogative to ask the first question is you have of course described some of the optimum uh, installation uh, methods for fiber and in, in sort of fighting fighting the some of the potential uh, uh, problems with with the elements. Um, in sensing, frequently uh, the applications, the fiber sensing applications use existing fiber. Um, uh, would you comment on the ability to, to kind of use fiber that's already been installed uh, for sensing that may not have been uh, optimized in this way? So typically uh, what you're referencing is that the pipeline operator has allowed or authorized the use of the right-of-way, the landowners that, that own that right-of-way have allowed the pipeline operator to 
to authorize the installation of an optical cable along the pipeline for the uh, for communications. And then, and then, can you then turn that same cable into a sensing cable? The answer is yes, you can. You can use the fibers that exist, and typically, in those in those applications, the fiber will be inside of a loose tube cable. So, the, a very common sensing technology is to do the uh, temperature sensing. But as I mentioned, the gel filled cable works very well with acoustic sensing. So, those types of systems can also be deployed. And then, uh, you know, strain sensing is also deployed. You just have to, uh, it's just not as sensitive. The loose tube cable does, will work with a strain sensing environment, but it's not nearly as sensitive as what we talked about with those fibers that are tightly coupled. So I, we see these different types of sensing systems deployed on existing fiber cables um, for the pipeline. One of the challenges is to, for each sensing system operator is to define those distances between where the cable is physically installed and located relative to it, its position relative to that of the pipeline itself. And uh, so it really comes to the comes to the to the sensing system provider to have those discussions with a, a pipeline operator to say what will and will not work with the with a cable that is pre-existingly installed along the pipeline. But uh, what we've highlighted is what you could use going forward, and the system vendors can talk about what can be done with existing, pi with existing cables in the ground. They can be certainly be used. But you're describing really the optimum uh, use uh, case as opposed to taking advantage of what's already there, um, and you've yeah, addressed and some of those. Sure. Right, and but but in each case, if they're you know, once you know what the cable is, then you can select the sensing system that takes advantage of what that of what that fiber configuration provides. Um, with what are the challenges in the pipeline environment where, in effect, there's a brownfield application? Now, that is to say that. Um, uh, the, there is not currently fiber in uh, in the right of way, uh, and um, pipeline operators are looking to add uh, fiber. Uh, clearly, one of the challenges is is this installation problem of of obviously not wanting to interfere in any way with the pipeline. Um, right. How how do you address those considerations? Well, there's uh, many considerations there, and many many pipeline operators will just publicly state that they don't want any kind of work done in and around their pipe. Um, so it's very problematic. What, uh, as a member of the technical committee for the for FOSA, we're actually looking at developing some guidelines for installation in new construction as well as installation guidelines for, for existing brownfield pipeline constructions. But the uh, the element there, of course, is to is to lay the cable in in the close in as close a proximity to the pipe as you can without without causing damage. And each scenario is um, is different, so that's one of the one of the challenges of the technical committee for FOSA this year to to really issue some specific guidelines along those arenas. There are people who do brownfield installations, and again, it's really just identifying the location of the pipe and uh, carefully laying the cable beside it, either trenching methods or, or with various methods that are done with trenching and so forth. Got it. With uh, telecommunications looking at uh, densification of fiber optics through increasing bandwidth and increasing the number of cables, how will this influence the ability to use telecommunications fiber? It, it, this is in order to reduce the cost of deploying uh, specific fiber sensing cables. So what you're referencing, yes, the the uh, optical communications industry, uh, everyone who uses optical communications can, is constantly looking for adding capacity because of the increasing data demands that we, we see from all of us using our smart devices everywhere. You add um, you had self-driving cars and all those kind of things. The data requirements for the communication networks continues to go, continues to grow dramatically. 
and what the what the op, these uh, telecom operators are constantly looking for is where to where can we install more cable and pipelines represent uh, an, a right of way uh, that can be used for these these cables which is why I, end, I ended my presentation with talking about uh, these uh, various hybrid cable designs where you would use a few fibers that are designed specifically for sensing and then you would add additional fibers for these communication services. One of the challenges that every pipeline operator faces <clears throat> is that they have their right-of-way agreements that they have with the landowners are usually very specific to the uh, to the transport of the petroleum product. And so when going back and overlaying a, uh, a different service along that right-of-way often requires a renegotiation of those uh, right-of-way usage rights and so it's it's not as it's not as easy as one would think to just go in to use a pipeline and and plow in some optical cables and and life is you know, life is good you have to uh, basically talk to every landowner and get permission to re to redo the network in that way but it does come back to the fact that every communication service provider is adding capacity when and wherever they can and they're constantly looking for new new right of way opportunities for getting cable from point A to point B. Got you. Any other questions? I'm looking for more questions, but um, I frankly don't see any on, on the queue right now. So <clears throat> I'll thank you for the presentation and, and also just do a, a bit of a plug for uh, some of our upcoming uh, webinars in January <coughs> on January 18th uh, FOSA actually you referenced the technology committee the technology committee will be doing a webinar on um, advancing pipeline safety uh, and this is uh, an event that is uh, uh, particularly aimed at uh, the regulators uh, the safety representatives in, in, in uh, for state and local or federal and state government uh, so that's coming up. Uh, and then on February 15th, uh, we'll be having a, a, a presentation by Adalus, which is a, a very innovative company and is a FOSA member. Uh, and then on March 15th, uh, a webinar with FOTEC. We'll be putting out more information about this uh, in the near future uh, coming up in the, uh, uh, in the coming year. Um, just for all of those who uh, may have missed or jumped in late on this, the entire presentation uh, that we've just done will be available on the FOSA website and also on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to download that. Uh, Joe, Joy Maloney gets this up pretty quickly, so probably within uh, 24 hours or so, we'll be able to have that available for those who want to access it uh, at another time. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for what has been a, a very informative presentation, and we also uh, thank uh, Prismian for uh, uh, making uh, these materials available to us. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating.